Um, I hope you can hear me with the microphone. Is that working? Good. So, um, being a surgeon requires that we have implants that we can trust. That's the bottom line. So, how do we know we can trust? Well, there's a number of questions that were brought up several years ago by uh, Gunnar Anderson in an editorial to Spine. He said we need to be asking these questions. What is it supposed to do? Does it actually do that? If so, is that clinically helpful? Are there alternatives? Is the new technology as good as the alternatives? And is it cost effective? Um, and you can see that I've italicized several of these because these are things that we can answer oftentimes in the lab. So does it actually do that? If it's a mechanical question, this can be answered in the lab. Um, is new technology as good as existing technologies? We oftentimes can compare one to another. Uh, in a lab setting first uh, is much safer than clinically, obviously. So implant development and modification, we have concept and design, mechanical testing, certainly a testing feature there. Uh, biomechanical testing in cadavers is the next step that usually we go through with a mechanical design. Uh, biological testing, then finally controlled clinical trials and then availability. So I think you're all familiar with this kind of paradigm that we have to go through. So what does a surgeon want to know? He wants to know, does it work? Does it work compared how does it work compared to what I use now? In other words, is it going to do it better? Is it going to do it the same? Um, how will it fail if it does fail? That's an important thing for us to know because we often have to revise something that's failed. Um, much of this is shown during the implant development process, so many times we can know how something's going to fail by mechanical testing. And then by the time it's in my hands, most of this is already demonstrated. So. That's why testing is so important. It gives us the basis upon what we can use clinically. So mechanical testing really exists as the foundation of implant development. It facilitates regulatory approval of any design changes as well as the initial uh, approval of, an, of a device. It provides insight into failures and it provides reassurance of those concepts that we're concerned about. So one of the very nice recent uh, articles that's come out, uh, or recent trends that's come out, is, is the uh, analysis of cervical discs. Um, a paper in the Spine Journal in 2004 really described the Bryan disc very well and went through all these phases with mechanical testing and load and motion simulators. Uh, they did uh, mechanical properties uh, just for the load, and then they also did wear simulation. They did animal testing. They did a human trial and then they, they, uh, mechanical testing was the foundation for all this progress. And, and we see this in this article going through all four phases of those, uh, that development process. Uh, there are countless implant changes that happen uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And then this uh, uh, really frequently is seen in joint replacement, uh, m small modifications or the, the numerous different devices you see on the market are all subtle differences between one device and another. And these alterations into design uh, are tested predominantly in laboratory settings. They're verified as equivalent to the existing design by the mechanical testing. And then spine implants, uh, uh, in particular, um, the uh, ASTM guidelines give us opportunity to test components or sub-assemblies as opposed to the entire construct. And this has enabled a lot of different connector designs, a different set screw designs, uh, just basically every aspect of the pedicle screw devices that we see. So insight into failures is something that uh, we got interested in uh, in with regard to the pedicle screw, de the uh, testing of pedicle screws, which was based upon a corpectomy model. And yet now the majority of pedicle screws are used in combination with anterior grafting. And so uh, the question is, what is the the failure mechanism of these pedicle screws now that we have different modes of loading. So we uh, developed a project with our colleagues at, at Empirical Testing um, to look at these uh, pedicle screw systems and couple it with um, different graft positions. Uh, uh, when you do a um, the different anterior grafting methods, they will be either far in front of the disc space, they'll be on one side of the disc space, or they'll be in the back of the disc space, and we wanted to look at those three different paradigms. So we did notice that there was a difference in how they failed in a unilateral plif or T-lif. You would see the, the breakage of the screw and the uneven loading of the, of the devices would cause even uh, dislodgement of the um, locking mechanism of the screw to the rod. 
Um, in the uh, no graft series, we found exactly what we found with the corpectomy series. Um, but the uh, ones that were loaded with the, the graft right in the front were completely protecting the, um, the pedicle screw systems. And so we wouldn't see failure of those at all. So a case example on the reassurance of com com concepts uh, from the clinical realm. Uh, we have a 16-year-old male. He's fallen 20 feet. Uh, he has back pain. He has no loss of consciousness, but it, unfortunately he is paralyzed. Um, he had uh, no strength in his legs and no sensation. Um, his x-ray looked like this, uh, and you can see that uh, on the top of the left, you can see that the spine no longer lines up. So that presents a clinical challenge of how do we get it to realign so we can stabilize his spine and initiate his rehab. And, um, you know, how to reduce it, how to keep it there once we get it reduced, and will that last? So intraoperatively, what we ended up doing is uh, placing pedicle screws above and below. We used a provisional rod um, with towel clip distraction trying to get it to work. The, the towel clip distraction did not work, so we ended up placing the pedicle screws. We did a transverse rod option where you put it across and then do a reduction maneuver. That got us about halfway there. And then we did a provisional rod with distraction and then placement of the, personal, the permanent rods. And you can see intraoperatively, we've got the screws placed here with the provisional rod. We utilize distraction. Um, we've got a pen field marking the, the back of the canals on the fluoro so we know where we are and, and know where the other vertebral body is. And then we were able to reduce, as you see here, we now have alignment of the spine and the pedicle screws placed. We placed the additional pedicle screws and then uh, the permanent rods after that. And so we were able to know those things in the OR because we knew how the subassemblies had worked in the lab environment and we knew it was reliable for the long term. So mechanical testing overall is an unsung hero. Um, it, it has allowed implant development to, to uh, go at a great extent. It's used for implant uh, and FDA evaluations and it reassures us of success and is in my mind a key component for patient safety and patient care. And uh, surgeons want implant expectations. They want to know that it will work. They want to know it is safe. They want to know it works best of anything else that's available. And it will not fail. And the bottom line is, I must trust in this device. I cannot take time to verify it myself while I'm caring for the patients. And so, naturally, testing is very important. So thank you. I look forward to any questions or